The blade length is exactly the length of my pointer. It's really important to get to know your maker and be very specific about what it is you're wanting it to do. Oh, you know, I just, I just want a hunting knife. Great. What do you hunt? Ozarks has a rich history of craftsmanship and people working with their hands. Um, and so I'm curious, you know, one, how you got into it. And then two, like what, what was the initial itch? And then two, kind of how you honed those skills and really got into knife making to, to begin with. Uh, so wide angle lens here, I have always had a passion for the outdoors. Um, whether it's hiking, camping, hunting, fishing, canoeing, kayaking, just I, I love all of it. And one of your most basic pieces of equipment is a knife. I mean, if you're not out there with a knife and good shoes, you're you're probably screwed regardless of what you're doing. Um, so in the pursuit of the outdoors, I started looking for better and better knives that actually fit my needs really well, that were a joy to use, that held an edge. And at some point in time, I wound up getting into um, purchasing kind of lower-end handmade knives. Um that's when I discovered there was a lot that steel could offer that you just don't find in stores. Mm. Um, fast forward a few years, I was going out to one of the guys that I was buying knives from. Um, I'm going to pick up another. I was debating between two models. Just wanted to chat with him a little bit and kind of hear the pros and cons. And he asked me, he's like, are you a knife maker? I said, mm, No. I said, well, you seem to have a good idea of design. Would you like to make a knife? I said, well, sure. I'll try anything once, you know. Just this is kind of neat. We'll see see what it is. Um, so he took me in and kind of became my first and main mentor in the craft. And it just kind of sparked an interest in me. And I kind of jumped in two feet forward. And next thing you know, I have... Less free money, fewer knives, and less time. <laughs> I was about to say, I'm looking around your shop here, and it doesn't seem like a guy who just happened into knife making. I mean, <laughs> there's so many gadgets and gizmos and machines and like huge machines. <laughs> what you said that one's like two thousand pounds almost, or uh, pounds? that uh, that mill is about sixteen hundred pounds. Um, so it's actually about a hundred years old, and. Uh, it's called a panograph, and so essentially that is what predated CNC machines. And you would make physical patterns, physical templates. You can scale them up or down by up to 20 times, and then on the top there's a little stylus that you can move. You can move that with your pinky finger, even though it's a 1,600-pound machine. Wow. And then on the work table below, it'll mill out whatever you're tracing. And... You know, those really became super popular around World War II because that was the cutting-edge technology. Um, factories would have them lined up in an assembly line. And so, like, Colt or Smith & Wesson that was making a part would have one panograph set up for one component of a gun. And the operator would mill that one little component over and over and over again, throw them in a bucket, send it down the line, someone else would assemble it. Um, fast forward, CNC machines are now creating the templates in a soft file, but the milling application is identical to that. So that technology is, is uh, outdated in an industrial scale, Yeah, but in a custom knife maker shop, it gives me the ability to do really precise inlay work, um, really intricate detail work, and I don't have to learn CAD or CAM. <laughs> cool. Very cool. Don't have to um, let the computer run it. You get to do it. Yeah, if I have to touch a computer, I do not want to make it. I mean, that makes sense. If you're into making knives, I imagine I want to work with you want to work with your hands. Yeah, yeah, so, it makes sense. It. Uh, I have enough computers at my real job as a therapist. When I get off work, I don't want to look at a screen. That makes sense. So he took you under his wing. You got a garage full of gear. Where Where do you go from there? Wherever my de desire just takes me. Did um, you just start at that point? Were you like, 
I want to start selling these. And at what point did you get good enough to where you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm making knives, but I'm really making knives well enough now to the point that I, I can sell these and, and people are going to get value out of them. I started selling them when people started offering cash. And you know, when I first got started, most makers sell stuff at below their cost for a while. And then Just to get their name out there and well, all that. Well, and frankly, they learn. <sighs> Their fit and finish mm-hmm. is not worth a premium because they're learning a craft. Got it. Um, and then at a certain point, you start breaking over and you're you're like, okay, I'm actually making some pretty decent stuff. Um, at that point, you're making a profit on the knife, but you're still funding tooling. And so the hobby business, whatever you want to call it, is really just breaking even and treading water and you're working for tooling. And then eventually you have enough tooling that you can pretty well do whatever you want to do. Um, and your fit and finish is at a little higher level. Your prices are a little higher and you start being a little more profitable. Um, that progression for most knife makers in the area takes between six and ten years to start actually turning a profit. Wow. Just because you have to make so many knives just to be able to pay for the, the tooling to the point where you hit that break even and then... Once you're assuming your tooling and stuff is quality and it doesn't break, you don't have to keep replacing and buying new correct equipment. So in terms of just general value, mm-hmm. you know, if you look at taxes, schedule G and H, G will be tooling, machinery, equipment, furniture, like the desk. Um, schedule H is materials, inventory, blah, 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 blah. Um, G and H in my shop, you're looking at currently around ninety three thousand dollars. Dang! And how how it's many years change. have you been doing it for? Uh, about eight years. About eight years. Okay. So what what about knife making? You kind of mentioned how you got into it. What about it was something that intrigued you and and kept you going? Because I you know there's some hobbies people get into and they're like, yeah, this is really cool. But the people who actually stick with something and they they go deeper and they continue to hone and get better at it. There's something else there, like kind of driving that, I, I have to assume. What was that for you? Uh, that's a multi-layered question. Part of it is I have, since ever since I can remember, had a desire to create things. Um, back in grade school, I'd draw pictures and sell them to the tattoo shop for them to put on people's bodies or whatever. Don't have any tattoos. I've never tattooed anyone, but I would make designs. You just like drawing them for people. Um, I just sat out there in class, bored while the teacher was, you know, I'm finished 20 minutes before she's done yapping at the other people. I got to do something to stay out of trouble. So I'd sit there and sketch. Um, Got out of it. I've done a little bit of furniture making, um, fire and water restoration. I made a rimfire rifle for silhouette competition, um, a bow, arrows, knives, just whatever. Um, I I just like working with my hands. And so when I get off work, it gives me something productive to do other than sitting in front of a TV, wasting away, Um, particularly in winter when the weather is really bad and it's dark before I get off work. And, you know, it it lets my mind and body work in ways that I don't do vocationally. Mm. Um, So that's part of it. Uh, the other part of it is what I'm able to create is a physically useful product. Mm. Unlike a drawing or a sketch or something like that, you know, that that has aesthetic value. But eventually somebody's going to redecorate and it's going in the trash. Um, but when you create something like a knife, that's one of man's most basic tools. I mean, we've been making them since we've been banging rocks together. Mm. You know, the oldest person ever revived or found was Oitzi the Iceman or whatever. And he had three tools. He had a knife, he had a club, and he had an arrow, which mm. is a knife on a stick that he used to spear stuff with. <laughs> yeah. um, so in terms of just basic utilitarian value, I don't know a single adult who doesn't use a knife in some form every single day of their life. I've actually never thought about that. That's a good point. And while I'm doing that, I can take something that is so common and so mundane and just elevate it in terms of ergonomics and aesthetic beauty that it also becomes an object of beauty that has sentimental value. Mm. I find a lot of value in that. Yeah, it's amazing. That's super cool. When I have something, and I'm thinking about my kitchen knives that I use... That we got as a wedding registry gift. And we didn't know what we were doing. It's like, that 
it looks like a good deal. Comes in a butcher yeah. block and there's like multiples of them. And how, how often, I mean, how many vegetables and chickens I sliced up with those things over the years. And then I remember getting a really good chef's knife for Christmas. And now it doesn't matter. Every single time I pick that thing up, I'm remembering how I felt getting it for Christmas, the first time I sharpened it, all that kind of stuff. And you just put words to what I was feeling. I didn't realize it was like that knife was actually bringing value into my everyday cooking for my family at this point. And it's like, it's like bringing me to a place. And you're doing that at, in the woods and in the kitchen, I imagine. That is the value of a handmade knife. Yeah. You do get performance gains. Um, and, and I'm not going to downplay that in terms of function, but for the cost of what my products are, you get more bang for your buck going to a factory if all you're looking for is can it cut. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if you're wanting something more than can it cut, that's where a handmade knife maker like myself can come into play. And I get to do some really cool stuff. I've done several matched father and son sets that they carry off and build memories with. Um, several fathers have contacted me and said, this is going to be my, my kid's first year to deer hunt. If he gets a buck, can you turn it into a knife? Mm. Yes, you know, for the to. cost of a shoulder mount, I can make a custom knife that will last the rest of his life, that no matter how many times he moves, you'll never run out of wall space for it. You'll mm -hmm. never run out of decor. It won't get ate up by carpet mites. Mm -hmm. It won't fade in the sun. And it's it, something he it's can there. Give, give to his kids and their kids and their kids. Absolutely. That is cool. What is So what is beyond that? Performance-wise, when you get down to, you know, how a knife cuts, and you mentioned can, if your question is just can it cut, that's kind of like the surface level. But beyond that, as someone, uh, the people who are listening who who hunt and fish, what would be some of the other benefits um, to using a handmade custom knife or, or just well-made knife that's not a mass-produced product that you could buy at, say, Cabela's or Bass Pro? Oh, there, there are a lot. So the biggest one is customization allows for specialization. And what I mean by that is if you think in terms of what's it going to cut, you know, and if you say, oh, I just want something that'll, that'll cut anything, great, you're getting a four-inch drop point. But if you say, all I ever hunt is a duck, that's what my family does. We're duck hunters. We've been duck hunters for years. I need a knife to go duck hunt. I can create specific geometry in that blade that matches the breastbone of a duck. So when you get ready to pop those breasts out, you twist your wrist and you have an intact piece of meat that falls in your hand with no waste. Oh, that's cool. You're not going to find that in factory. Well, you, you might um, if you're lucky, but it takes a lot of trial and error to find that. Sure. The other thing you can get is uh, specialized materials. Um there are certain steels that I have the availability to work with, uh, like CPO Magna Cut, that very, very few factories are running because it's extremely expensive. Like a one and a half inch wide, one eighth thick bar that's three foot long currently retails for about $270. You're going to get about four hunting knives out of that. Mm. Okay, so you can go to Walmart and buy a completed knife for less than just the raw steel before anything else with that steel. Yeah, before it becomes a knife. Right. But what that steel will bring you is corrosion resistance that is worthy of dive knives. Edge retention that's going to hit about six times higher than what you're going to get out of 01, which is a really common. It's what made Randall famous. You can grind it down to geometry that's about 10 thousandths behind the edge as opposed to 35, which is what you get out of 01. So you get thinner geometry, which lowers cutting resistance, which makes it feel sharper at any given level of edge refinement. That's performance. That's measurable. That's objective. And it matters sometimes. Mm, okay. <laughs> if, if your deer is strung up in your backyard and you got a work sharp ready to sharpen it, doesn't matter at all. If you're on a backpacking elk hunt, you're 13 miles deep, and your buddy lost his Havilon, now you've got two dead elk in front of you and only one knife to get through them. <laughs> it matters a lot. You're, you're going to pay for that performance mm -hmm. because that matters a lot. It matters that you can go into the field with something that holds an edge 
So you don't have to bring janky subpar field sharpening methods that suck always. (laughs) <laughs> like, yeah, right. they work, but nobody wants to sit around a campfire with a credit card size sharpening stone. Like, <laughs> swiping it a thousand times. No, just do your maintenance at home and go hunt. Yeah. And so you get a little bit of um, performance gains in terms of being able to optimize geometry, um, optimize materials. Um, and then, like we touched on earlier, you, you can start picking up some of the sentimental stuff. Sure. Yeah. You can use items that have either sentimental history to yourself or materials that are just valuable in general, like ivory or sandbar stag or something that's restricted that grows in value. So it becomes a financial investment piece more than just a tool. You can also use just materials that you find aesthetically pleasing. And, you know, just like a well-made rifle or a bow, sometimes having something pretty just adds to the enjoyment of using it. Right. That makes sense. What about, um, just as you were talking, I was kind of thinking, and, and this may be in a stretch or an extreme example, but in terms of speed, not that you want to be really fast and hurt yourself. Like that can be dangerous, I think. But speed in terms of like meat spoilage and being able to get your meat into, you know, a, like get it to a lower temperature faster to preserve it. Do you do you gain that much speed by um, by having those custom knives like you're talking about? All right, so the best answer is no. You gain that by experience. Okay. Um, because what's going to happen is the more experienced you become at breaking down your animals, the faster you're going to be at it sure. because you know what you're doing. Yeah. You will never be able to trump that simply by purchasing a product. But as I say that... I'm pulling out my small game hunter, which is just my generalized skinner. Good for everything from squirrel to elk. We're getting into it here. Garrett just stood up, kicked his shoes off, and grabbed his knife. (laughs) So what you're looking at on this, and and it's not a sales pitch. We're just talking design here. The blade height is the maximum height that will fit inside a squirrel or a rabbit pelvis to break that open. Okay, so what is this, about an inch? Right at an inch. Okay. Okay. And that gives me the most amount of vertical height to create the largest amount of sweep, which is good for medium to large size game animals like deer, elk, pig, etc. Mm-hmm. The blade length is exactly the length of my pointer. So when you go in to come up the belly from the inside out, there's a 0% chance you will ever nick a gut pack mm. because your finger covers the point. You're on the point with the finger. You don't have to guess. You don't even have to see it. Your hands can be completely numb in the field. You go on the belly, you just feel where you want, poop, it's open. Then when you go to put that inside a ball joint, um, thinking high and quarters on ungulates, mm-hmm, sure. you've got about three quarters of an inch here on the tip, and it's just long enough to get into that annular ligament. So you poke it in there, twist it, it falls apart. Cool. All of this is by design. Yeah. And I'm not saying that this knife is the only one that does it. There are multiple factory knives that are very similar sizes and proportions because they work. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I stumbled on this out of field experience and testing. And after I started making it, I discovered several other people make similar knives. But also there's things about this, like if you look at the handle contours, they're relatively flat with rounded edges. That's intentional. So that when you're holding it, there's a tactile reference for... What is vertical? What is horizontal? When you go to do a torquing motion to pop the breast meat out of a duck or pop that annular ligament, you have something flat to do that torquing with as opposed to a knife that is fully rounded mm-hmm. and circular in, con- in contours like a puko for wood carving. Mm-hmm. Um, you're not going to have the control out of a puko breaking down a game animal like you would this. But... You're also, because there's not highly anatomical contours, if you run this knife really hard for bushcrafty type stuff, you're going to get a hot spot. So, you know, there's no free lunches here. It's just specialized design. Um, And there's even things like you notice there are no holes in this knife. Right. That's intentional. I will not put a lanyard hole in a skinner. Nobody skins an animal with a lanyard around their wrist. (laughs) All it is is a hole to gather blood, gut, nasty yeah, goobers. bacteria. <laughs> like, so when you talk about specialized design, 
I think it's really important to get to know your maker and be very specific about what it is you're wanting it to do. And if you just show up and say, oh, you know, I just, I just want a hunting knife. Great. What do you hunt? Sure. Where do you hunt? Do you clean the animal on the ground? Do you clean the animal on a gambrel? Because I can actually change the geometry to optimize breaking down an animal depending on your body position for it. So you can get very specific. I'm not magic. <clears throat> this is just physics. Yeah, this is design, intentional design. And I do that with my customers. So I've got a question for you. I'm, I'm a guy who's, who's always kind of looking for um, a good knife that is going to work for me for skin and deer. And I love deer hunting. Every fall, that's kind of what's on the mind. If you were going to create the perfect buck skin and knife for me, what would that look like? What would what would be the design that you would go for? Like if we just if we were, if I was com- your customer, and I'm coming to you right now. Like I want the best buckskin and knife that I can find for hunting the Ozarks. I have to have a lot of questions answered first. Okay, where are you hunting them? Um, let's say Madison County, Arkansas. Okay, so Ozark Hill Country here in the Ozarks. Great, field dressing them. Yep. Are you quartering them out? Are you deboning them? I'm going to field dress them, and then I'm going to bring them back to the to the cabin, and then I'm going to do the rest there, hanging up. All right, so you're field dressing them where they lie. You're pulling out the, the whole carcass minus the guts. You're hanging them on a gambrel. Do you have access to water? Yep. Do you have access to ice? Yes. Yes. Do you <laughs> optimize? Me for, where's the deer camp? <laughs> I'm like, your cabin, Kyle, do you have ice? Yes, there's ice. <laughs> Um, next thing would be, how long is your pointer finger? This long. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, I mean. I'm going to go three inches here. Okay. Yeah. So men's large glove. Okay. Yeah, that sounds right. You're going to get about a 3.1 inch blade, about one inch tall. You're going to have a parabolic curve that comes down roughly 0.6 inches from the back. You're going to leave a little bit of flat spot there because there are places like the outside of the tibia that are flat that you need to scrape to pull off the flanks. Um, it's going to be hollow ground on a 14-inch wheel, probably somewhere in the ballpark of 10 to 12 thousandths behind the edge, full height. That'll reduce cutting resistance at the edge. It'll increase cutting resistance at the top of the knife, but meat is really squishy. Mm-hmm. So it'll make it feel like a straight razor, not like a hatchet. Your handle is going to be basically the width of your, your palm because it's custom made for you. Sure. It's going to have a drop on it that matches basically the lifeline on your palm so that you don't get any hot spot there. You're going to have a little bit of an increase in mass on the pinky side because contrary to popular belief, your pinky and your ringer finger are where most of your power and your grip comes from, whereas your pointer and your middle finger is where you get dexterity. Oh, so when you hold on to I that knife with numb, weak, tired hands at the end of a 14-hour hunt in the middle of winter, you want to be able to just caress it and then use your pointer and your middle finger along with your thumb for all dexterity while maintaining control of the knife on the pinky end. Therefore, the back end is going to be a little bit more bulbous than the front. We're going to put an integral guard on it or an external guard, whatever you prefer, to prevent your hand from slipping forward onto a blade, particularly because you may be tired, numb, wet-handed when you're doing sure. it. Sure, yeah. All right. From that, you have... Basically, 90% of a pattern drawn that is very specific to not only the animal you're hunting, but the person who is doing it, right? how and where they're dressing it. Everything else is aesthetics from there. It's materials. It's how do you want it to look and, and yep. what kind of sentiment do you want behind the materials you use? Yep. It sounds like we're getting knives. <laughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> so I'll take one of those. <laughs> so... I'm a little technical with how I build. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, some guys are just like, bang it out. It looks like a knife. Sell it. Somebody will like it. Yeah. I think it's cool though because um, it's kind of like you almost, you kind of have to be eccentric a little bit. Like I can tell that you know your stuff. Like you know the specs and you've really thought through the, the design of it. Because if you're going to make a high quality custom knife and sell it at the price that you want to sell it at, you got to deliver the value. Like you got to be legit and, and kind of have thought well, through every piece of it. Even outside of price. Why on earth would I waste my time doing something if I'm not going to try to do it well? Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm just going to 
half-heartedly give it a whim and just, oh, we'll see what happens. I'd rather be fishing. Yeah. Well, and, and <laughs> when, you, when you talk custom knives, too, this is something that, and I'm sure however people, craftsmen specifically, however they market themselves, they can use whatever words they want. and It can mean different things. But when I think custom, I'm probably thinking, you know, here's a knife maker who's going to let me pick my steel and maybe pick my handle and generally pick the type of knife I want. So your example that you gave earlier was like, I want a hunting knife. And that, in my mind, is probably the three, maybe four things it would be is, yeah, that's what I want. But you're and saying... in my mind, that is that's semi-custom. Like n- nothing, yeah. Well, because that maker is starting with a pattern. Mm-hmm. They're just selling you the pattern. Sure. And they're saying, hey, hold, you know, this is my hunting model. Yeah. Take it or leave it. You can pick your handle. Yeah, right. it's, it's no different than going to a car lot and saying, I want an F-150. Yeah. Red or black paint. It's like calling... Leather, leather or carpet, uh-huh. you know. Limited. That truck <laughs> isn't made for you. Right. It's like calling the pre-build neighborhoods that you pick the countertops, like custom. Yeah, right. exactly. I mean, maybe, but it's not. Yeah, like, you custom put your kitchen here home or here. is different. So what you're selling, though, in the knife world is the, the primo custom home version of a knife. Like, we're measuring your hand, talking through how you're going to do it, where you're going to do it. Absolutely. Type of skinning, all that kind of stuff. Dude, that's incredible. That is so cool. Like you sold me. Off the shelf <laughs> I want stuff a knife. is semi customs. And <laughs> we'll talk when it's not deer season. <laughs> let's be completely honest. What semi customs are, 100% of that geometry is made to fit my hand. Hmm. And the reason for that is I have to be able to feel it. I have to be able to look for hot spots. I have to be able to use it. I have to have confidence in my product. Mm-hmm. And God only gave me my hands. I'm sorry I can't feel the world through yours. <laughs> mm, yeah. So every semi-custom or stock knife is made for me. Yeah. Period. Mm-hmm. Now I may sell them, and if your hands are similar size to mine, they're going to feel really good. And if they're not, they're going to feel, meh, not mm-hmm. really good. There's nothing I can do about that. Yeah. But when people come to me wanting a custom product, 100% of that product is made for them. And people whose body build is drastically different than mine it is not uncommon for me to make patterns with them in my shop that feels good to them, not me. And when I get ready to contour handles, they come back to my shop mm. and we contour handles for their hand. Yeah, that's, yeah cool. that's cool. That is really cool. So, okay, so I'm it's gonna, a very different process. Yeah, it's neat. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna come from a different angle here. I have in my hunting pack an outdoor edge knife with a replaceable blade that slides in and out. And I love it. And it works great for me because the blades are sharp and I can clean a deer. And if it goes dull, which it does <laughs> very quickly, I can get another blade out of out of the case and put it right back in there. All in this little knife cost me, I don't know, maybe 30, 50, 30 to 50 bucks, something like that. And it works great for me. Um, and then on the flip side of that, the affordability of that is really good for me. So when it comes to a custom knife, like you're talking about, talk to me about how might I think about weighing the value of a custom knife, which may be $300, I, I don't know, $300, $400, versus the outdoor edge knife that works, that gets it done for me. You know what I mean? Well, that is really easy to answer. Every single person on this planet will shop within their means. Period. If you're happy with what you're using, it's good. There's nothing else you need. But if you're looking for more than you can get out of a factory, that's when you talk to a handmade maker. Yeah. If you're looking for more than you can get from semi-custom handmade stuff, that's when you talk to the full custom guys. And I will never be the person who looks down on somebody for having an inexpensive knife. I own several as a matter of fact, one of you just picked up a Rapala fillet knife. I think you can buy those for like $12. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So I've made knives that sell in like the two and a half thousand dollar range. Wow. I own a $12 knife. Yeah. I also make fillet knives. You know, I, I use those as well. It, it's not wrong to have basic equipment if it's meeting your needs. If it's not meeting your needs or your desires, that's when you look elsewhere. Yeah. I really like that answer. Yeah, I do too. Because I think it's it's something like it's like anything else. You can spend as much money as you want to, and and then you can go cheaper and, and get the job done. 
but there is a line when you're if you're like you said you know that you're not selling your handmade knives to everyone everyone is not your customer sure you're looking for the person who wants to take it to that next level that's it and there's value and, and purpose and meaning and having a wide variety of price points because it makes it accessible. Mm-hmm. And not everybody has the same goals for any given product, which is why you see things like, you know, uh, I'm really familiar with Leupold Optics line. Okay. You can get a pair of binoculars, the Yosemite line, six by thirties or eight by thirties. They're $99 out the door. They work really well. You can also go to Swarovski. And you can pay three and a half grand mm-hmm. for a six by 30. Those work really well and then some. Mm-hmm. And you can go anywhere in between. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in the knife making world, you're going to find that law of diminishing returns just like you do in any other manufactured good. Sure. Where at a certain point, you're spending more money, you are getting more product, but what you're getting per dollar spent is less and less and less the higher up the scale you go. That's just true. Yeah, that makes sense. So, you talked a little bit about the aesthetics of a knife, um, especially one that somebody may interact with daily, or they're bringing out into the field every fall, or they're you know providing for their son after a, a first deer hunt. It's kind of a, a heritage, kind of legacy, pass something on. Um, talk talk to us a little bit about some of the material that goes into kind of crafting and aesthetically pleasing, but also worthy to, worthy to be passed down type knife? Like what what separates it from, you know, the the Kevlar handled Walmart knife that was my first deer knife into something <laughs> that you, you know, you're, you know, you're looking at in the woods going, I'm so glad I have this knife. So a big part of that really ties into individuality and personality. You know, like one guy may, it may really tip his trigger to look at a Gunworks rifle. That's all modern, stainless steel, fluted barrel, carbon fiber, Macmillan stock, you know, just all the bells and whistles, right? And then the next guy he's hunting with may be out there with a cap and ball musket with silver wire and lay and little gold medallions and hand cut checker. And he's like, oh, this is the, this yeah, is the ticket. This is and you're going to find um, stuff anywhere in between in the custom world. And, and that's what I like to be able to offer people is... You know, if you're into modern materials and and really technical gear, I do a lot in carbon fiber. It's mechanically probably the best material available for a handle material. Um, Most of what I make is in stainless steel because we live in Arkansas and everything rusts. Right. I mean, some of your simple high carbons you can coat in oil, sit it on a shelf at the end of hunting season and come back the next season and it's rusted. (laughs) <laughs> and so, mm-hmm. you know, this is a thing. Nobody likes their high-end knives to rust. So most of what I make is stainless. Um, and I'll I'll use a couple different alloys depending on people's needs and preferences. Um, and then on handle materials, it, it really boils down to their, pers- their personality. So some people really enjoy woods, um, either really exotic domestic or exotic imported woods. Mm-hmm. I have both on hand. Um, I work with some of the best dealers in the nation, and I have them cherry pick the most extremely figured pieces available. Um, I'm, I have a very large passion for the animal products like uh, mammoth ivory, sambar stag, elk, sheep's horn, um, all of that. I have a couple of really good dealers there. We work very you closely. Said, you just said mammoth ivory. Yeah, so I, <laughs> I, I do a few. Um, the first knife That's that, crazy to me. that I made in it was actually for my wife uh, as my brow tine model. Um, the first brow tine I made with Walnut from Keith Brown Shop. He's in a Stockmaker Hall of Fame guy. He does pistol grips for revolvers. Hmm. Sends me some of his scraps of exotic stuff. So I did, some, did one in English Walnut as a donation piece for St. Jude. I brought it into my wife because she is brutal on fit and finish. I said, "Here, check." Your wife it. is? Oh yeah, she's she's <laughs> she's nasty about it, but uh, but it's great, you know. Like that's that's what we I just need. Met her. She honesty. didn't come across as someone who's a stickler for that kind of thing. No, she is as sweet as can be. But when I ask her to critique my work, she holds nothing. That's good. That's a good wife. You need that. Yeah, yeah. It's it's out, it's out of love. It drives me to make better product. And she can see a little better than me, so she sees some flaws that my eyes can't. More importantly, she doesn't have calloused hands. 
and she can feel things that I can't feel. Mm, yeah. And so she'll be like, don't you feel that little bird? No. Well, it's right here. So, okay, I'll sand a little more. Mm, yeah. Um, so, you know, I brought it to her and she rolled it around and she's not a knife person at all. Like, she thinks it's cool that I have a hobby. She doesn't really care. <laughs> and uh, probably how most wives are with their husbands. She just kind of <laughs> she grinned and she said, "I think I'm going to keep this one." I said, "No, you're not." She's like, "No, I think I'm going to keep this one." I said, no, you're you can go on the list. Um, that one's for the kids at St. Jude. I'll make you one. She just looked at me. She's like, "Really?" <laughs> I said, "Yeah, yeah, that one's for the kids." So. Yeah. You know, we were talking, uh, I think we were eating some ribs out at Smoking Joe's. And she's like, I kind of like white. I was like, okay, we can do some ivory. And uh, wound up doing a multi-part handle that had ivory on the front and rear and then mammoth tooth in the middle um, with brass spacers. And that handle was the single hardest handle I've ever done in my life. Because when you buff brass, it it streaks black. And so... It turned all the white ivory black, and then the mammoth tooth really likes to chip out and flake away. And so it was it was awful to produce, but it's gorgeous. Yeah. And so now she's happy, and she opens her Amazon boxes with the world's most expensive <laughs> box cutter. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, but yeah, you know, I just I, I like to play with different stuff. Um, I kind of have a passion more for the natural materials, the exotic woods, and and particularly the animal products. And what I really like to do as a craftsman is bring out the natural beauty that God put in those materials through my work to celebrate the diversity and the complexity and the beauty of the world that he made. And, you know, one of the things that I don't think I have an example of it on my own stuff right now that I've, I've been doing a lot lately is... Uh, carving the hardware on antler and sheep's horn handled products to match the natural contours of the antler so that when you feel it, you can't actually feel where the hardware stops and starts. Mm. And you also don't have to grind away that pretty bark pattern, which is the whole purpose for using it. Right. Um, so I picked up over a thousand dollars in equipment to be able to do that. And it still takes several hours a knife. But, when you're done, it looks and feels amazing. Yeah. What are some of your other favorite knives that you've done? Or, or maybe just some kind of exotic materials or cool stuff that you're like, oh, man, I just got lucky happened into one of those. Or just some, some memorable experiences from, from your knife making All right, so I'm going to get journey. one. This is a Catch-22 because it's one of the coolest materials I've ever worked with. Okay. But it's also my least favorite as a craftsman to work with. And I'm going to let y'all guess what you think it is. Okay. This will be a fun game. I promise you, you're not going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So just describe what you're seeing in this material. Okay, so this looks to me like some kind of patterned glass. And it almost has like a, it's a checkered pattern. And it, it's red and kind of orange, and it, it looks like a stainless or not a stainless, like a stained glass you might see in a in a church a little bit. I see some copper in it. Copper, oh, okay. Look at the sides. Yeah, we got it's a bunch of layers in there. It looks like a basket weaved out of copper. But I have then, no idea what it is. But then it feels like. Yeah, dude, I have no idea. What is this? Is it is it a glass? No. So is that copper? is the armor that makes um, mine-resistant vehicles for our military bomb-proof. What? That is what? from a government overrun. That's MRAP armor that they used for armor plating MRAPs for Operation Iraqi Freedom. The fiber in that is Kevlar. <laughs> which naturally has a light yellow tint. Mm, okay. And the epoxy resin is red. And so the deeper into the epoxy you go, the more red it looks. The, the closer you get to the Kevlar, it turns more of a goldy, brassy color and everywhere in between. It's like holographic. It's beautiful. Yeah. So it's super cool. And I've done a couple for veterans in that. Now, why I hate this stuff with a fiery passion is if you've ever worked with Kevlar... 
it doesn't really cut. Oh. Just like flay, it kind of so flails open. It kind of pulls the fibers out mm-hmm. when you work it. Yeah, you can feel the fibers on the, if you and run so your thumb on the edge. When you go to grind it, it throws little Kevlar splinters into the air mm. that can go through your clothing and stick in your skin and cause a lot of irritation. Mm. I work in a, uh, it's called a PAPR respirator. Um, it's like a full like spacesuit, Darth Vader hood looking thing. <laughs> I have to wear a Tyvek painter suit and nitrile gloves and tape at the wrist. And so when I work on that, I look like I just showed up to a hazmat scene. <laughs> <laughs> Your wife comes out and she's like, "It uh, is." I'm going to go back inside. <laughs> awful to work with. But it's a really interesting material, has a super cool history. Um, I've got somewhere around 12 square feet of it, which is a lifetime supply because I'm not doing very many in that. Yeah. That is super cool. Um, so that's kind of neat. So that's called MRAP. That is MRAP armor. I have a letter of authenticity for that somewhere M-rap in my shop. armor. And, and what kind of, for? so you've made some for veterans, what kind of mm-hmm. knife would, would they want or did they want? Um, I did this? two fighter designs and uh, one Skinner and one fillet in it. Okay. Very cool. And you will not find pictures from me of any of those. Mostly because I hate working with it, and <laughs> you don't want other people requesting it. <laughs> no, no, no. But when <laughs> yeah, I don't want to publicize that. But you know, here you are talking about it on a podcast. People are going to be like, oh, when I a, want one of those. a soldier shows up to you and he's like, "Man, I love your work," and blah blah blah, and we get to talking. These guys and their families have put their life on the line mm-hmm. and survived all sorts of disruption. I don't care how hard that is to work with; they're going to get what they want. Mm. If they want MRAP armor, you got it. So be it. Yeah. I mean, just you have to support the people who make your life possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know there's a lot of people that stand behind our veterans and our police, and I know there's a lot of people who really don't. And I can't go to bed at night knowing that these people are out here putting their life on the line to protect me and my family and my wife. And... I had the opportunity to bless them, and I just chose not to out of laziness. I, I, I can't do that. Yeah. So if they want an MRAP armor knife, I buy a Tyvek suit and we make it happen. It. <laughs> <laughs> what? What, what about some other knives that you've made, some other memorable experiences? Mm, well, I did. I you, had, really, you had the one at, at Black Bear Bonanza, I know. Oh, yeah, that one was kind of cool. That was so cool. Um, mm-hmm. if y'all aren't familiar with that one, I'm, I kind of know Clay-ish. Like, we bumped into each other, but we're not friends, really. Um, I guess you'd say distant acquaintances. Um, and our friend circles kind of overlap a little in some regards. But I know James, which is the president of Arkansas's BHA chapter. Yeah. Backcountry Hunters Mr. and Angers. Brandenburg. He's been um, on here a couple times. Yeah, he's he's bought a couple of my knives and great guy. I mean, he he's just worth his weight in gold. Absolutely. So him and Clay are pretty close. He and I know each other pretty well. And we just we wanted to do something special for the Black Bear Bonanza. Um that really it, it had nothing to do with me and my craft. We wanted to celebrate conservation in Arkansas. And we wanted to do it through local resources. And I just happened to be one very small component of that. And so Clay shot this black bear he nicknamed Batman. Biggest bear he's ever taken. He happened to have the femur of it somewhere in his home. Um, He donated that femur to me to use as handle material. And from that, I selected the portion of the handle that kind of felt the best. Yeah. Um, Sawed that off, returned the rest of the bone to Clay, and patterned a blade shape really to fit the bone. Um, so I chose a nest muck design because uh, George W. Sears was a really influential early explorer and writer, um, wrote for the predecessor of Field and Stream, and uh, that, that pattern was heavily used by bear hunters in the Ozarks before, um, you know, we, we quit having a lot of bears. And th- what did you call it? What's the name of the design? Uh, it's a nest muck design. Nest muck? Ness, N-E-S-S-M-U-C-K. So okay. 
It's just, it's kind of like a drop point, but it has a little bit of a hump on the spine. Okay. I'm going to Google that as you are talking. Yeah. You can see what it looks like. Yeah. So I made a nest muck pattern that that fit that bone, and my whole goal was just to highlight the bear. And you know, when when James was asking me about it, he's like, "Well, what does this mean to you?" And I said, "I don't know." And he said, "Well, <laughs> what is it valued at?" And I said, "Well, you know, if a hunter came to me, this is what I would charge him." Oh, cool. what I cannot tell you is what the value of the provenance of Clay's femur is. I mean, that that just depends on how big of a fan of Clay Newcomb you are, right? Sure, yeah. I, I don't know that. There's nothing in world history that could approximate this. Um, so when I was building it, I was I was really thinking, what was involved in making this happen? You know, uh, uh, on the surface level, it's a hunting knife. And a pretty nice one. Yeah. And it's got a, Kyle just showed me, that's why I said, oh, cool, a second ago, you just showed me the design. But uh, Very unique uh, blade and outline. Yeah, kind of curvy, kind of interesting. And, you know, I was thinking about that, and I was like, well, you know, it started with exploration and finding bears in Arkansas. And that became legend. We were the bear state for the longest time, and commercial hunters came in and hunted our bears out nearly to extinction. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, at that point, you know, commercial hunting kind of disbanded. They were primarily looking for the fat to sell bear oil. Right. Um, the hides and the meat had a little bit of value, but really it was the oil that they were after um, from rendered bear, render bear fat. And so Arkansas just became devoid of bear. And then at some point in time, the Game and Fish, Arkansas Game and Fish, said, you know what, we need to get black bear back in Arkansas this is their natural range. They had an ideal habitat. Mm-hmm. We still have ideal habitat. We need to bring them back. And so they pioneered um, a program to bring back bear, and it is actually the most successful reintroduction of a predatory species in the world right here in the Ozarks. Right, and, yeah. And now we're having bear hunting in Missouri. We're having bear hunting in Oklahoma. We're having bear hunting in South Arkansas. And so this reintroduction of bear was made possible from hundreds of thousands of hours of man hours to reintroduce these animals. Thousands of hours of land management to make the the habitat habitable to produce a large bear. Hundreds, if not thousands of hours of clay newcomb being mentored and taught in the skills of hunting and learning and refining that to be able to harvest that bear, the forethought to save the components that are non edible. And then in my own craft, thousands of hours of mentorship to learn how to create it, plus time to produce the product. And even down to the sheath, it had an inlaid uh, beaver tail that another one of our board members on BH, BHA trapped off of a public land here in Arkansas. And so when I was working on that, you know, I, to me it was more than a knife. It, it was the story of what a sportsman life can be mm. and how to honor all of the people who came before us through my craft, all of the people who made that that product even possible well beyond me, many of which I've never met and never will, and you know, just what it means to be a part of something bigger than Polk Knives or a knife shop or an acquaintance of Clay or a member of BHA or anything real and finite right here, right now. Yeah. And those are the types of memories that motivate me on custom orders because they're they're nothing that you're going to get from a factory. You can't. Yeah, man, that is so cool. To to the way that I really like the way that you approach that to think about how you might even begin to value that because really, a knife like that is is worth at the end of the day as much as someone may pay for it. Not that this, this one wasn't for sale, right? It was offered up in, a, in right. a drawing, so it wasn't for sale. But you could put you could place any number on that, and and if someone's going to pay for it at that price, it's it's worth that. So the way that you kind of said, all right, well, let's put that off the table number-wise, like thinking about everything that went into that historically leading up into now, 
is so cool and it make to me it makes the story of the knife that much cooler to think about how you approach it as the the craftsman behind the blade and putting it all together from all of these different influences and places and materials and all that to bring it into one cohesive package that you can now put in front of someone and give away to ultimately go back into conservation. Yeah. Through BHA yeah, I mean, it, is so cool. It just tells a story is, is what it is. And my chapter of that story is very, very small. Mm-hmm. And, and you get to see it put together. It's like the intersection of all of yeah. it though. Yeah. I mean that, that one's somewhere on my website, uh, ivory bear knife, I think is what we called it. Um, we're gonna do another really cool build for this year's this year's this year's BHA, Black Bear the next Bonanza. 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 Heck yeah. Man. I'm not sure exactly where we're headed with that, but it's gonna be badass. But it's That's coming. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. It's coming. I've got one more for you, Garrett. If you had to build the perfect the perfect Ozark knife, and you can think material, shape, use, whatever, but it just the knife built for the Ozarks, what would you build? This. <laughs> <laughs> so the Skinner we talked about earlier. Yeah. Would you use the sheep horn handle? Um, probably not. If I was gonna really dig into specifically Ozarks, mm-hmm. um, I would probably use a handle material that you can find here in the Ozarks. And I would be torn between either using a black bear bone um, just because there's there's such a symbol of the wilderness and they thrive here like sure. no other animal right um, I might use uh, wood from the chinkapin tree um, that one I'm, I'm getting some raised eyebrows that's an oak right so, uh, it's similar okay. um, so the chinkapin is uh, a tree used to be out kind of in the central Ozarks area a lot. And it's a really, really rich nutrient source for game animals. You will watch game animals leave a white oak acorn to go eat a chinkapin all day long. The problem with them is they're really susceptible to disease. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so as people have moved in and their natural habitat has shrunk... It has concentrated some of the diseases in the areas where they're at, um, and there's very few of them still out there. Uh, right now, uh, the Park Service and Game and Fish are both working to increase the population of chinkapin trees in public lands. Um, here locally, Hobbs actually has quite a few that they're putting up. Um, it's really neat wood. And if you ever stumble on one, just mark it in your Onyx maps, Okay early season about two to four weeks before the white oaks start dropping any animal that eats a plant will eat that chinkapin seed Hmm. we're talking bear deer pig squirrel turkey everything loves them and it drops its fruit ahead of the white oaks ahead and through the season that the white oaks does um and they kind of look, you know those little sweet gum balls that you step on that are yeah. like little devil balls? The little spiky balls. Okay, yeah, they kind of look like a mix between that and a dandelion. Like they're little balls, they're, they got some little spikes, but they also got little fuzz that comes off of mm, them. Okay. Um, really cool tree. Um, that one's kind of unique to the Ozark mm-hmm. region, which is part of why I might do that. Um, the other material that really kind of speaks to me from here is just the white oak. Mm-hmm. And I know that's really common, but the white oak in the Ozarks is the predominant food source for all game animals yep. up here. So if you were going to do something that just really celebrates the Ozarks region, it would be really hard to look away from the white oak. It makes yeah. sense. You mean it's not a big pile of corn? <laughs> <laughs> no, but you can get in that root ball and get some really gnarly... Um, they call it spaghetti grain, where it kind of splits under the weight of the tree. Oh, that's cool. And comes up. It looks like a big ball of ramen noodles. Mm. Um, it's gorgeous stuff. In the wood, it'll look like that? Yeah, I got some over there. Oh, I, I want to look at that, that off mic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 
So. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you one kind of softball question to wrap us up here. Um, what 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 do the Ozarks mean to you? Why do you love living here and and hunting here and fishing here and producing your knives for people here in the Ozarks? What like wrap it all up for me? What what about the Ozarks is special to you? This is home. I mean that that that's really it. Every everybody has a place that they can go to where they're at peace. And for me, it's the hills of the Ozarks. And my family is strewn all over the South. Um, there's not really any particular town or region that everybody's gathered at. So you know, when I graduated college and was moving, I'm like, well, we'll move anywhere. There's not really anywhere to call home. Um. But there's a peace amongst the limestone formations in and around the Buffalo River Valley, out towards Hobbs, out towards Beaver Lake, um, all of these wilderness areas that is, it, it just sinks into your soul. And I've been several places that have a similar peaceful feeling, um, like Alaska comes to mind. You hear people talk about just the majesty of Alaska. It's it's there. Um out towards the Grand Canyon, that same inner peace is there. But I have no family anywhere remotely close to those locations, and I do to Arkansas. And when I'm out in the hill country here in the Ozarks, I'm just at peace. It's it's home. I love it, man. That's so, as good as it gets. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not a very deep answer, um, but it's real. It's plenty deep. That's plenty deep. I mean, that's, that's, I think everybody kind of has that special connection to a place. And I think that's what a lot of people find, you know, in common, um, whether that be here in the Ozarks or, or other places where they're from. But sure. you're absolutely right. Pe- the connection to home and connection to place and where you're comfortable and where that really sinks in. That's, I mean, that's, that's as deep as it gets. <laughs>